Hi, I'm Kevin Rhodes. Welcome to Expositions. It's sometimes interesting to listen to the eyes different people have about false teachers. To some, it would seem that they simply do not exist in their eyes. But on the other hand, to others, they must be lurking around every corner because of the, how suspicious they are about everybody and how ready they are to jump on any kind of difference at all. The first group accepts just about everyone with open arms and with no suspicions whatsoever and really, honestly, with blinders on and they, they just refuse to see anything that's there that's different and that's a problem. That, that would include a, a lot of people that we would think of in terms of being very liberal with the scriptures and going into uh, different uh, churches and denominations that, that just ignore certain passages of scripture. But the second, on the other hand, and the way they view false teaching, they're so suspicious that they will often reject a person just based upon someone's accusations. Or if you were associated with somebody who was associated with somebody, who was somebody who was associated with somebody somewhere along the time, or maybe you got to the point of where you at one time babysat their dog, that you have a red flag go up, and without ever being able to identify something false that the person teaches, they still would label you a false teacher. Now, those extremes pose a problem because it shows that we're not very good at really understanding the problem of false teaching. False teachers do indeed exist. The New Testament declares it to be so. But what is the proper way to respond to them? And what's the right way to treat them? These are questions that we rarely ask, and we see that in sometimes our inability to deal with differences between people on what they believe. Rather than choosing between the two approaches that we've already mentioned, as with all things, here, too, we need to examine the answer that God Himself has provided in the Scriptures. When John wrote his first epistle, he knew that he would not be around forever. So he wrote to prepare Christians to face false doctrine on their own without the benefit of a living apostle, since he was the last one at that time. And for this, we turn our attention to 1 John chapter 2, beginning with verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. It is interesting to talk about false teaching in this context because of so many false ideas that are taught erroneously from this very passage. But let's consider what he has to say for the benefit of these early Christians who were facing the false teaching of Gnosticism and he is explaining to them how to handle the situation. And the very first thing he points out that we need to know as well is very simple. And it's this. Expect false teachers. Don't go into life so blind as to think that no one out there is teaching falsely or that is not looking out for your best interest, including when they have a Bible in their hand as I do here. In verses 18 and 19, he says this, Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. We ought to be expecting them, he's saying. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. We ought to expect, and we therefore we need to know what to expect. In Jude, verses 17 and 18, Jude said this, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. Now that's Jude essentially describing the same kind of false teacher. 
but let's consider what we need to do in understanding and recognizing them. And part of this is, he says, expect them to attack when we are vulnerable. He's looking down and he is saying, it's the last hour. You're coming at this time in which you don't have as much information at your disposal. The time of miracles is going to be ending. You're going to be in trouble. In Ephesians 4 verse 14, the Apostle Paul warns that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Why? Because... We need to be aware of these things and be prepared for them, as Jude again points out. For he says that for certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, Jude verse 4. He was not saying they had to be false teachers, but he's saying you need to realize that God warned that these people would come in and we need to expect them and prepare ourselves to deal with them. But when we think about false teaching, we sometimes get confused about it. And again, we note something from the text itself. He references... The Antichrist is coming. Even in my, my New King James Version, Antichrist is capitalized as if it's talking about some one major figure, and it's not. And that's shown by the fact that even now many Antichrists have come. He's pointing out you've been warned that there's going to be someone who comes and opposes what Christ's teaching is, the gospel and Christ's church. And he's pointing out, look around you, that's already happening. If you're looking about just one person, he says, you've got many. For many walk, of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. You see, we a lot of times, in, even today, we have people who will come up and they'll write a book or there'll be a teaching largely or in some way based on what revelation is, though they pervert that greatly, they are teaching falsely about it as if they can identify by that book certain times in history and that now we're coming on and this person is the Antichrist. How many times do you have people try to falsely uh, determine that some next war that's becoming, well, this is Armageddon. They are going on trying to make up things to scare people, but really they're doing it to make a buck. They're getting people to buy and in and follow after them, buy their materials, because they just want followers. And it's someone who opposes Christ. That's what the word antichrist means, someone who is against Christ. It doesn't mean that they come on and say, hello, I'm against Jesus. It means that by their action and by their teaching, they're wanting to lead people in an opposite direction Against, they are anti-Christ. They're going another way than what he teaches and what Jesus died for. That's a false teacher. That's what he's pointing out here. And the scary thing that we don't often realize in, is that they will present themselves as being godly. They will come from within. They will present themselves as being people who love the Bible and love Jesus while at the same time teaching things that are not found in Scripture when interpreted correctly, that they will twist to their own devising. You know, when you end up with people that are on screen, on television, and all they want you to do is send them money all the time, as if, and tell you and the prosperity gospel that if you'll send them money, you'll get rich. Well, they're the ones that are getting rich. Or you see the people who are just down trying to uh, get a big following and have a fancy bill and everything, and they want as many people as possible, and they won't ever mention sin. Well, that's an antichrist. They're leading people in a way opposite of where Christ is going. We need to realize, though, those kind of people can come even from within the body of Christ. In Acts 20, beginning of verse 29 and verse 30, the Apostle Paul, talking to the elders at Ephesus, said this, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. As a matter of fact, Paul 
in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, went into great detail warning about a specific apostasy that would come. He warned that people would go away from the truth and would go after something that was really devised by men as he really pointed to the apostasy that would become the Roman Catholic Church. It was that clear. That was just as much against Christ then as people today. And we need to be prepared to recognize it and expect it. But we need to be ready to do more than that. And that's why the text continues in verses 20 and 21. And he says, don't just expect false teachers. You must be prepared to reject false teachers. He writes, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. He's saying you have the information you need at your disposal, but you have to use it. In Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul told Titus, Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. Now that was one type of false teacher in a sense, just by being divisive, but that principle applies across the board. We have to not just notice the fact that someone's teaching falsely, we have to make sure, expect it to come, but reject it when we see it. We must be able to recognize and reject that for what it is. Reject all teachings that are not supported by inspiration. That's a basic principle. Notice again verse 20 and follow along with me. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. He is pointing out that they had access to information because of the inspiration at that time provided miraculously. But he says, you now have and can know what you need to know. We have everything we need in the Bible to recognize what is truly from God. And if it's not in agreement with this, to reject it. God's given us what we need. And that's why in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, that principle is so important. These are more noble than those in Thessalonica because they receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. In their day, they were searching just the Old Testament to see if what was being said about the Messiah and showing that Jesus fulfilled those uh, prophecies was true. The same principle applies today that you can check to see from the Bible whether or not someone truly is showing you what the Bible says and what it means. Now, just because they're quoting a scripture doesn't mean they're telling you the truth about that scripture. And just because they quote that scripture doesn't mean they can't, keep it, they can't take it out of context. We have to search the scriptures so we know the difference. And we also have to be prepared to reject the intimidation tactics that imply that we're not capable of opposing people, that we're not capable of knowing enough to speak out. Because sometimes a false teacher will come on the scene and they will act like you don't have any business correcting them or pointing out what the Bible says because they somehow are on a higher plane or know more than you do. Well, we're not disputing that there can be different levels of knowledge based upon study. But we need to be very careful of falling into that trap and being silent when someone is simply promoting themselves and acting like because they have a certain number of years in or a number of degrees or they went to some fancy school that that gives them a monopoly on the truth. It doesn't. John, in writing to, back in his day, ran into a similar problem. And he said, whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. We see the similar idea here. And that have is talking about has a relationship with, has fellowship with. In Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, Paul wrote saying, Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, this is talking about elders, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict who go against Christ and His teaching. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. 
who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not, false teachers, for the sake of dishonest gain, notice a motive. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, he says, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Now notice the character of what he is saying. You have to be ready to reject people who are teaching something that's wrong. If you don't, you bear the burden and a responsibility of letting that go on in your midst and in your mind when the Bible says something very different. You have to be ready to reject false teachers' claims that they're adhering to the truth and be able to point out the difference. That's why you have to be prepared. John 8 verse 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall free you or make you free. And that truth is found one place. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17 verse 17. Don't be fooled. If someone says, oh, I believe the Bible, then go back and say, well, why aren't you doing and teaching what the Bible says? And there are plenty of examples that we could give you. Think for just a moment. Someone says they believe the Bible. When asked, though, to show that how they worship, whether that's found in the Bible, can they do so? And if it's pointed out that it's not found in the Bible, are they willing to change? Or are they going to stick with what they've always done? Where's their heart? When they come up and they teach something about salvation, and they talk about a sinner's prayer, what are we going to do? Are we going to just accept it and move on? Or are we going to do something about it? We have to recognize that and reject them entirely and not give them any room to move forward. And that brings us then to the last thing he brings up in verses 22 and 23. We must be willing to expose false teachers. Notice what he says. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. We have to be willing to point out the difference or we end up being part of the problem. In Romans chapter 16, verse 17, it says we are to mark, to keep an eye, a close eye on those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine of Christ. But we need to do so in a very specific way when we're pointing out the problem. This idea is not about just simply exposing people by calling their name out. That really doesn't accomplish much unless you're just someone that you think that your word is alone is good enough to say that someone's wrong. We need to expose a person's lack of respect for truth. Notice what he says, who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He's here applying the principles he's already established and saying here's an example of someone who's an antichrist. He's lying about something that is actually true in scripture. Jesus is the Messiah. If you're going to deny that, it needs to be exposed. And you do that by using the truth. He just comes on and says, it's the truth that Jesus is the Christ, and someone who says otherwise is lying. So if you take a scripture and you simply say that Jesus said that you need to be baptized to be saved, the truth shows that in Mark 16, 16, someone who denies that, is therefore teaching falsely. When you think about what basic truths are, we need to realize there is a place for them. Does God have standards for how He expects to be worshipped? According to John 4 and verse 24, He does, and we need to apply those, but do it properly. The truth will expose false teachers, and that's how we need to approach it. Remember in Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 9, there the Apostle Paul pointed out what they needed to do in response to these Judaizing teachers who'd come in. Now the Judaizing teachers were false teachers. They were Judaizing teachers coming in and saying you had to keep the law, specifically circumcision. Now notice, they were adding something to what God required. They were adding something in and wanting people to do something that God did not want there. 
And Paul's response was very clear. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you to the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there is some that trouble you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. Now, notice the foundation of that. The gospel. And then he says something that is not the gospel. What I preached versus what I didn't preach. What you received versus what you did not receive. It's about the message, the truth. There is a standard, this message that's found in the Bible that should expose false teachers, and we need to use it. Later on in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, there he will point to this and show you have a responsibility to use the truth and expose those who will do this? But you do it, notice, based upon where they deviate from truth. You don't just call their name. You say, this person is teaching this from this passage. Here's where they're wrong. Here's what they're saying. And I'm not making this up. Here's what's going on. But we also have to be willing to expose their identity. Notice he continues, he is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. He's very pointed here. That person, whoever it may be, that's who I'm talking about as a false teacher who's against Christ. And he's denying, notice, the Father and the Son. He connects it. He says they're trying to say that that's not connected. If you deny that Jesus is the Messiah, when that's what God says, you're denying God too. Notice that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 19-20, that Paul was willing to do this, but he's very specific. Having faith and a good conscience, which some have, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Here's what they did. They were teaching this and following this. It was wrong, and they need to be corrected. Don't follow them. You know, the, la- the worst thing that can happen is for you to know of someone that's teaching falsely and never pointed out to others and let them go down and be following them. But the right way to do it is to point out the teaching and emphasize why the teaching's wrong. Not just the man. A man's not wrong for being a man. They can always change. People need to understand the truth and that they will understand and reject the teaching of any man because the teaching that they're doing is wrong. Help them know the truth. And that means we have to be willing to expose the implications of their teaching. Now we look again at verse 22, who denies the Father and the Son. You see, there were also false prophets even among the people. Even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. 2 Peter 2, 1-3. That's how Peter described false teachers. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire, 2 Peter chapter 2, 20-22. He began the chapter, here's how they behave. He ends the chapter, here's what's going to happen to them. But he was pointing out in between, here's what they're doing wrong. We have to expose these people for their own good, as well as for anyone who would listen to them. And that means we expose their spiritual destitution. You see, they are really in poverty. They have a message that leads to spiritual poverty. Jude described it in saying that these are spots in your love feast. Well, they feast with you without fear, fearing only, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried away by the winds, late autumn trees without fruits, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, 
raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Jude, verses 12 and 13. The point of that passage, as he's addressing the problem of those who are going to pull, trying to pull away Jews to, for political and really patriotic reasons, away from the church and for the truth, they don't have anything to offer. Not really. If you teach an empty doctrine, then all you're doing is offering empty promises. When someone tells you that you can just simply, you can pray some prayer and be saved, that's not found in Scripture. That's an empty promise that he's making. If he says you could ignore portions of the Bible, you need to recognize that's not true and you're going to lose out on it. It takes you into spiritual poverty. So be careful. False teachers exist. They are out there. And we need to be ready for them. False teachers. We should expect them. We should reject them. We should expose them. My friends, we cannot afford to ignore them. False teachers do not announce their presence, nor do they announce their identity. Therefore, we must be as vigilant about them as we are for their commander-in-chief, the devil. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13-15. through 15. Therefore, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. We need to be on guard because false teachers are out there. As with so many things, we often make the mistake of thinking that they will just go away if we wait long enough. Experience alone should disprove this notion. False teachers have been around since this time in the first century to this day. Right now, up to today, we have a plethora of false teachers in the church because we suffer them to be in the church. This does not mean that we should tar and feather them, but we should be proclaiming the truth in its purity so boldly and broadly that they are no longer comfortable to remain in our midst. In some places, false teaching has not yet declared itself openly. But the truth is that many congregations are a breeding ground for doctrinal error just because they will not stand up for the truth. Treating false teachers for what they are is not only about protecting the church today, it's about preserving the church for the future.